Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. My name is Mike at Filmboy24, and I'm really excited because today I want to talk about, sort of do an overview of my Aeroflex 16 ST 16mm movie camera. And I'm going to show you a few clips of this old Vision 2 50D. I just got it, this film, recently. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, I'm excited. That's right, today is all about the Aeroflex 16 ST, well, my 16 ST movie camera. This, this whole overview and breakdown, it's going to be not comprehensive. It's not, you know, fully, doesn't fully encompass everything there is to know about these cameras uh, because I don't know everything there is to know about them. I know a fair amount, I know about mine, and I know I love them. Before I get into that, I do that a lot. Uh, I do want to update and let you know that I just officially ordered a Movie Stuff Retro Scan Mark II film scanner. So look for that. I'm going to do a video on that. It'll be some months ahead uh, because uh, it takes a couple, three months for them to build them. They build to order. And I'm just super excited because... I finally got one coming. So that one will scan my 8, Super 8, 16 millimeter. It actually does tons of different formats, but for me so far right now, that's what I've got coming. Uh, excited about that. Uh, I did shoot some more film here and there. I got some Super 8 stuff coming. So really excited. Got some more found film coming soon. But today, let's forget about all that. Let's talk about my Aeroflex 16 millimeter ST camera. Aeroflex. Founded in uh, 1917, I believe, by Mr. August Arnold and Robert Ritker. Rick, Richter? Richter? That's how they got the name, by the way. Arnold and Richter. A-R and R-I. I don't know what it would have been like if... I mean, what if Robert wanted... Well, anyway, it would have been... Rianne. The Rianne Flex. And Flex came from, they were the inventors or the creators of the Reflex system, which is exactly what this is. Reflex simply means when you look through the viewfinder, you're seeing exactly what your lens is seeing. A lot of the old school cameras had that parallax finder on the side where you'd look through and it, and it kind of would give you sort of a field of vision of what your lens was seeing, but it wasn't an exact science. This is a Reflex camera, which simply means what you see is what you get. You look through the viewfinder, whatever you see, that's what your lens sees. This particular model has a bow tie mirror shutter. So it's mirrored so that when light enters the lens, some of the light hits that mirror and is reflected into your viewfinder. That's why when you look through and you're running the camera, it flickers a little bit, kind of like the K3 does. It's also a mirror shutter, so you see the brrr, the flickering when you look through the viewfinder. That's all it is. It's light hitting that mirror and reflecting into your viewfinder. Now, there were a couple of variations of this. There was the Airy 16S and the ST. Mine is the ST model, uh, and they're basically the same camera. They also had the Airy M, which is a very similar in design. The Airy M will not take 100 foot internal loads. It'll only operate on the, on the magazine, the 400 foot loads on top. These cameras here would take ugh, a 100 foot load. You simply twist the mechanism on the front cover, pop the front door off or side door off, and there's the inside of the camera. Now it'll take 100 foot internal loads, as you can clearly see. Your feed reel goes on top. These are relatively easy. I would say five out of ten as far as loading. Take a little bit of getting used to because of the sort of the registration pin and the pull down claw here. A little bit different than in some cameras uh, like the CP16 does not have a registration pin and in this particular camera you have to make sure that pin is not engaged when you thread the film because it has to go in front of the pin. We'll talk about that in just a second. Your feed reel on top in the number nine position, so the film coming down in the nine slot, and you follow the little white line right around. So there's a little, a little white line that tells you exactly how to thread it. I'll throw a picture up of this camera threaded so you can see exactly. I'm not going to thread it here today, but you can see how easy it is. There's a little button right here on top uh, of your pressure rollers, and it rockers these rollers back and forth, and that allows you 
to thread your film into the main guide rollers that catch your sprockets. When it's threaded, push it back up and it locks it back in place. Now, like I said a second ago, these particular cameras have a pull down claw and a registration pin. So the purpose behind the registration pin is to actually engage your film in one of the perforations and hold it in place while the shutter rotates, opens up, lets the light in, exposes that frame of film, the shutter continues, closes, the registration pin disengages as the pull down claw comes, grabs another perforation, pulls it down, registration pin holds it in place, shutter opens again, and that cycle continues. So the theory is that the registration pin holds your film in place, nice and snugly, while the shutter exposes that frame of film. It's supposed to, in theory, keep your film way more rock steady when it's projected or transferred. So there's not a lot of weave in it. So in other words, the frame versus the perforation, the frame doesn't move around while the perf stay still, the frame and the perf should be pretty much even. I will tell you, I've shot with this camera a few times and that's definitely true with this one. Now there are some cameras like my K3, I know they're not all like that, my Krasnogorsk 3, non-registration, wind-up camera, and it's pretty rock steady as well. So it's not always the case that you have to have a registration pin, but it really helps. Anyway, let's close this up. Like I said, this is not a comprehensive video on everything there is to know about these cameras simply because I, I don't know everything there is to know. I'll go over some of the basics, like this is an eight volt version of this camera. I think they also converted some to 12 volt, minus eight volts, and it has not been converted to four pin power. Some of them have the four pin XLR power cable or, uh, or outlet here on the side. Mine still has the original two pin, which plugs into the bottom, right there to a four pin XLR on the other end. That is how they were originally designed. And that's how mine still is. Now I did manufacture DIY my own battery packs for this camera. Uh, if you're interested in checking that out and see exactly how I made three, check that four battery packs, eight volt battery packs for this camera. I'll put a link somewhere up here for you. Check it out. I made them for like under 25 bucks a piece and that's good because I'm cheap. Uh, so, and it worked great. It'll run, you know, six, six ish, seven ish, eight ish, hundred foot loads, my battery per pack. And it'll run a couple of 400 foot magazines at 24 frames per second. And I'll show you very quickly. And I also did a uh, charger. I made this little charger, very basic little 12 volt battery charger. And here's my batteries that I've made. I'll just show you real quick. I keep them in this little case. If you can see that. One, two, three. The most recent three that I made. I made one and then I made version 2.0, way more milliamps. Uh, but I put on off switches on them, all of them. And they need to be turned on to charge. And I have a charge port on the side here. You can also charge using the... Uh, four pin XLR here, but I usually just charge with the little plug here on the side. And I'll show you in a minute, this on off switch is kind of neat as a sort of a little remote as well. So we'll put these away. Now the motors on these cameras, most of the ones that you're gonna see, set this to the side. Most of the ones that you're gonna see are going to have these either constant speed. This is a, a standard airy motor constant speed, usually at around 24 frames per second, or a variable speed motor, which is what this one is, that's designed to go from, I think, about eight frames to about 48 frames per second. These are not crystal motors. These were wild cameras. They were made for field work back in the day. They were released in the early 50s, and they were really designed to be used for like news gathering, non-crystal sync news gathering. They're as loud as a blender. Uh, they're not crystal sync. However, however, how they did make this, these are aftermarket. They made a couple of variations of crystal motors. The one I have here is a George Jensen 24 frames per second crystal motor. Tobin 
also made crystal motors for this. In fact, Tobin even made crystal variable speed motors for this camera. Uh, I have the George Jensen one. This is the motor that I use to shoot this roll of film that you're gonna see here in just a couple minutes. These cameras came with three lens turrets. And that is simply so you could put three lenses on it. And they rotate like so. The lens right here, right by your thumb, or your finger rather, that's your taking lens. When your lens is here, that's what's exposing your film. So when you needed a different focal length, you just rotated the turret. Most of the time, there were three prime lenses on these. Now, a lot of people use the Ingenue zoom lenses or some other brand of zoom lenses, which is fine, but they really were designed for these three primes. Mine has the 10, the 16, and the 50 millimeter primes, the Schneider Kruschnack. I don't know exactly how to pronounce them. Um, great little lenses, basic lenses for these cameras. They're old. It's an old uh, glass, but they work great. Uh, good and sharp. Pop these back on. And these were Airy standard mount, by the way. Uh, not PL mount, the positive lock. That was on the later Airy cameras. There are a couple of meters on here. You have the feet. So if you have a 100 foot load in here and you have to set this manually before you start shooting. This is your footage counter and it counts the feet of film that's run through the camera. So you set it to zero run the camera and you have to do it manually it doesn't reset when you open it so you set it to zero run it to whatever whatever you have in here 100 foot is what i usually shoot and the bottom one here is a frame counter it also has a tachometer right here on top this gauges how fast your motor is spinning in frames per second there's a little there's a little red tiny little red mark in it right at 24 frames per second. So if you want to shoot at 24 frames per second, you simply rotate this. When you rotate clockwise, your motor speeds up counterclockwise. It slows down. You rotate it until that tachometer hits right around that 24 frames per second mark or whatever frames per second you want to shoot at. Leave it. And it's, it's the click system. If you can hear that. So you can easily leave it locked in. These motors are very easy to interchange. Ugh. Open this little lock here, counterclockwise. And the motors, you kind of just got to wiggle them out like so. And the motors, the little, the little knob here on the end, the little pin here, when the motor goes in, it engages a little rubber boot inside your camera. There's a little rubber boot in there, and those little rubber boots can kind of get hard and cracky, so they have to be replaced sometimes. Mine's in pretty good shape, but they engage the little rubber boot, and that's what drives the entire system. Now the motors go in, same way they came out. There is a little pin right here on the side of the motors, on both of them, that has to engage a little notch. <sighs> So you simply slide it in, engage the notch like so, tighten the lever, engaged, motor's in. And this has that 24 frames per second motor I was telling you about. Now, one of the accessories that was available for these cameras, and a lot of times when you find these cameras for sale, they'll come with it. Mine didn't, I may pick one up eventually, is a matte box. These were, they were, there were matte boxes specifically made for these SST cameras. And this little cold shoe in the front, that's what it was for. It would, it would actually slip down. There would be an aluminum bar that comes out and then your matte box sits in front of that aluminum bar and you could expand or contract it. Uh, it's a good little tool if you're using mats or filters of any kind. Like I said earlier, the viewfinder is a reflex finder and it also has on the side of the eye cup here, it has this little iris open and close to sort of block light you see it opening and closing? When you slide the little lever, it opens and closes. It's also adjustable, as you can see, as you turn this outer ring, it's got a diopter. For people like me that wear glasses, you take your glasses off, you look through, you shine it at something bright, and you focus this on the grain of the ground glass. That's really what you want to do. Once that's set, you leave it alone. Now it's set for your eyes. So in other words, then if I put my glasses on and look through it, it's going to be blurry. This camera is a little bit heavy. 
weighs between eight and nine pounds, depending on what you have on it, not including the 400 foot magazine, which is plus or minus four kilograms, something like that. And that's with a hundred foot load inside, but it's pretty ergonomic and has this handy little, very neatly designed thumb grip here on the side. Your thumb goes just like this and your fingers right here. There's a little like a, uh, I don't know, a grippy right here in the front around grip. And then whenever you're taking lenses in place, these lenses have this focus, these little flanges here that make it real easy to focus while you're looking through the viewfinder. And yes, you can see how well your focus is through the viewfinder, thanks to your, your mirror shutter. Sometimes when you look through the viewfinder, it'll be a black screen. And that's because when you stop the camera, the shutter just stops wherever. It's kind of like, you know, windshield wipers. If you try to stop them in the middle, then you might just stop in the middle of your, your windshield. So you'll have to turn both motors, all of their motors, have this little spindle on the back. And as you turn it clockwise, it's rotating your shutter. So when you're looking through and spinning this, your shutter is going to go in and out of your frame line. So you turn it a couple of times and your frame will come back in. Then you want to focus and you're good to go. They also come with if you're only going to shoot internal loads, you have to block the light up top somewhere. So there's a port cover and you just, it just pops off just like so. But that gives you access to put your 400 foot mag on. And there's the opening there for the magazine. Otherwise, slip that on just like so. And it locks in place and you're good to go. So let's put some power on this and I'll show you kind of you know how it sounds it's not like i said it's not a quiet camera they did make a blimp for this but it was extremely large bulky heavy all metal just like kind of putting this into a tomb <laughs> or into a coffin and you know you could see in the it was it was big 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 but it fit your 400 foot magazine and everything else so if that's the route you want to go. I have shot sync sound with this camera before. Um, if you're interested in seeing how well it syncs up without doing anything at all to the video or the audio, I'll put a link to that video up there somewhere. Check it out. So we'll take one of my battery packs. It's off now. And plug it in like so. Your power button is right here on the side. You push straight down, and then to stop, push this little lever here on the side. And that releases the power button, and your camera stops. So down. Now, the way I have this designed is I put an on-off switch on my battery packs. Ooh. See there? And when it's running with this 24 frame per second crystal motor, it's very loud. You hear that? Put it by the mic. But you can see the needle stuck right at the 24 frames per second mark. Now, when you open it up while it's running, it turns off. That's because your on-off switch on the side door, this switch on the side door, when it's when it's engaged it depresses this little this little button here on the bottom of your camera so when you push it in now when you're loading your camera and you have it hooked up to your battery pack that's what you're going to use to continue the threading or to check your threading it's simple push this little lever on the bottom that's all all right let's get this plug back up or unplugged I'm going to put the cover back on. We're going to put a 400 foot magazine on here and show you what that does. So to put your 400 foot magazine on, take off your port cover. This is a fully serviced by me and completely taken apart and serviced 400 foot magazine with an eight volt torque motor attached to the side of it. You know what? Let me show you how simple it is and what it looks like when you take these motors off. This is a torque motor. This is an, an external motor that's needed in order to drive the mechanism inside the magazine. And you will just flip these little dials up. That's it. That's all there is to it. 
back down, turn the dials clockwise, counterclockwise on this one, and your motor's attached. These magazines are a little bit different than the CP16 magazines that we talked about in my CP16 video in that you have to load this magazine in total darkness. The CP16 has two doors, so once you load your feed reel side, you can, in essence, you know, you have to do that in the dark, but then you can put the lights on and you can actually thread your camera and load everything else in the light. This is going to be exposed on this side, but it's okay because this is complete. I don't know. It's, it, I like the CP mags much better, but these work just fine. So the way you attach these, this little device here on the bottom, up and down, there's a little tab here on a spring, boing, boing, boing. And that keeps this from flipping up because when that's up, the magazine can be released. Hook the bottom down, pull it up, and then this tab pulls down. So when you get, and when you push that down, it's engaging the top bar up here and locking it in place. But you have to, I can't really see what I'm doing here, but then you have to pull this spring and engage it. And that holds that little uh, flange down and does not allow it to pop back up so that your magazine falls off in the middle of filming. And that's it. That's all there is to putting these ridiculously heavy magazines on your camera. Now let's put some power to it again. Again, my $25 eight volt battery pack. Start it up, turn it on. See it turning. Mm. To remove the top door, or to remove the side door of these, you push this little, there's a little lock here, but you push it in and you twist. Mm. Like so. That's the inside of the magazine. You put your cores in, Put your film in. Whoa, you settled down. And you're good to go. Let's turn it on. Take up side, spinning like crazy. Now it's probably a good idea, whenever you shut these off, and you're using a magazine, when you shut it off, there, there's sometimes there's a little slack on this side, and you're gonna wanna turn this roller a little bit on the back to take up the slack on this side. You just wanna turn it a little bit, take up the slack, and then drop your battery, and then get going again. Let me unplug this before I ruin everything. That's essentially all there is to it. And the magazine, everything loads exactly the same as your 100 foot load. You get your magazine loaded up in the dark, you run it through the bottom, you run it back up, and then you, you tie it up to your feed side here, close it up. Now you can load your camera in the daylight because you pull that loop through, load your camera, and you're good to go, good to go. Put this back together. Ugh, man, I tell you what, I feel for those news people back in the day that had to carry these things. You get about 11 minutes of film at 24 frames per second with one of these magazines. <laughs> Woo! Oh, and if you're an old guy like me and your back already hurts, yeah, I feel for them. So what did we do with this camera? That's, that's, that's as much detail as I'm going to get in with this camera right now. Um, but I do want to tell you that I purchased 60 rolls of film recently from a guy. A guy contacted me on Instagram and he said, I got this film, a whole bunch of it. Are you interested in it? Or do you know what it's worth? Told him what it was worth and I was honest with him. And I said, but that's not what I can pay for. Here's what I can pay. And he gave me a heck of a deal on it. Uh, his name is Griffin Kerwin. I'll put a link to his, uh, his Instagram up here somewhere. Check out his page. He's a, he's a really, really down to earth, cool guy. Gave me a great deal on 60 rolls of film. Uh, 54 of those rolls were Vision 2 50D. Now, if you know me or my channel, you know that my favorite color film stock in movie film is 50D. Now, it is Vision 2, so I was a little bit worried because I don't always have the greatest luck with Vision 2. So I shot a test roll, and I figured, what better camera to use to shoot my test roll of Vision 2, which is right here, than my Aerie 16 ST. So I took this camera out into my garden or my backyard and just 
ran the film. I just showed whatever. I, it's, you're going to get bored with the actual footage because it's just my backyard. But this was the very first roll that I, that I shot out of this batch. This is a new roll, by the way. Out of that batch. And I just wanted to see if the film itself was any good because you just never know. Uh, so what better way to test it? Now, again, if you know me, know my channel, you know that I process all of my own film, movie film, uh, still film. I do it all myself. I scan all the film myself. This is no exception. I would get way better results if I sent it to a lab because my results are always hit and miss, uneven. You know, you get splotchiness and I get, you know, flickery and whatnot. 90% of that comes from my developing. Anytime you develop at home, it's not going to get lab results. Keep that in mind. I'm going to show you some clips from this particular roll of film right now. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with this film overall. I, I feel like if I did send it to a lab, I'd get really, really good, clean, tight results. I love the grain pattern in this 50D. It's nice and tight. Um, sharp lenses, pretty sharp, content. Colors look pretty good. This particular roll of film was manufactured in 2009. So we're talking about 13 year old film that I shot. I'm, like I say, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and I know that my sister's cousin, uh, on her husband's side, her best friend's next door neighbor's hairdresser would say the same thing to me like she does. Nothing wrong with Vision 2 film. And I'm kind of tend to agree with her. So, so that's what I have for you today. Uh, I know you're probably wondering what this cup is. Uh, I like to support low budget films and I've talked about this film before in the past. It's killer. Uh, it's a very, very low budget $9,500 feature film that was shot in the late 80s on Super 8 film. I am not sponsored by them. They did send me a mug and a t-shirt. He's a good guy, the director. Uh, if you're interested in checking out the DVD or the Blu-ray of Killer, it's a low budget slasher horror film. I'll put a link to it. It's sansperf.com. I'll put a link down in the description. Check them out. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, or if you enjoy videos like this, I got a lot coming, do me a favor and consider subscribing. Uh, I'm a, just a goofball. I enjoy the heck out of doing this film stuff. 
Uh, I have a lot of fun doing it, and I hope you come along for the ride. If you would do me a favor on your way out, it's free, tap the like button for me. And until the very next time that I, I see you, particularly, you know who you are. Mm -hmm. I'll see all of you on the very next go around.